All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for coming this morning um, for our panel discussion about a unique collaboration that we formed at our institution to kind of meet an unmet educational need. Um, our panel has nothing to disclose. So I am Dr. Casey Wilson. I'm part of the emergency ultrasound faculty at Hopkins and a former resident of the program. Next, we have Dr. Tiffany Fong, who's our emergency ultrasound director. She needs no introduction, Dr. Linda Regan, our residency program director. And last, we have Dr. Jonathan Lin. He is the um, program director for our regional anesthesia fellowship um, and one of the inaugural rotators through the ED POCUS rotation. So just going to start with a very brief patient vignette to sort of put this into context. It's probably not something that's too foreign to anyone in the room, but um, you're taking care of an elderly gentleman after a mechanical trip and fall. He comes into the ED with right hip pain and inability to ambulate. And um, you know, you order some preoperative labs and some x-rays, um, which confirm your suspicion that he has indeed sustained a hip fracture. And so you consult the orthopedics team. They're planning to take him to the OR in the morning. And you're sort of tasked with managing his pain in the interim. And so you give him IV morphine. But um, unfortunately, he develops an agitated delirium. He gets worse. and. Um, requires both physical and chemical restraints, and ultimately his um, operative plan is delayed. So this isn't an uncommon scenario. There are about 300,000 hip fractures annually in the US, and what we know is that if you break your hip and you're over the age of 80, your one-year mortality is as high as 40%. So in comes a role for alternative modes for analgesia in the emergency department, which is the focus of our talk today. Um, this is one option, it's the fascia iliaca block, and we don't need to get into the mechanics of it too much, but it's basically an ultrasound guided um, plain block where you infuse a large volume of local anesthetic below the fascia iliaca um, with the hopes of surrounding the femoral nerve, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the obturator nerve, in local anesthetic to really reduce somebody's pain in the acute setting and basically bridge them to the OR. So, you know, a lot of us are feeling more procedurally facile with ultrasound. We're doing procedures, IV, central line placement. And this is something, you know, an anatomical area that we're familiar with for other procedures. So it's not technically very difficult, um, but is there evidence to support its use? And the answer is yes, especially with regards to the femoral nerve block. And probably the nicest summary is the Cochrane Review from just about a year ago. They looked at um, 31 trials um, over about a 36-year period. Um, that included almost 1,800 adults with hip fractures, about half of whom received a nerve block and half didn't. And what they found is that there's very strong evidence to support that peripheral nerve blockade was very effective at reducing pain in the acute setting. Um, and there was moderate evidence to suggest that these patients had a reduced risk of postoperative pneumonia. They were able to mobilize sooner, be discharged earlier. There were very, you know, if any, complications at all as a result of the procedure and reduced overall costs. So if it's easy to do and there's evidence to support its use, why aren't we doing it more? And so we sought out um, sort of a needs assessment um, in the form of a survey. So thank you if anyone in this room responded to our survey. Um, we reached out to all the emergency ultrasound directors at every academic residency institution in the US. And if there wasn't an ultrasound director, we reached out to the program director to sort of gauge what's the current state of training and utilization at your institution. And we got a pretty good response rate, about 140 programs responded with a, a spread of three versus four year programs that was pretty reflective of the current national average. Um, about half of them did offer ultrasound fellowship and the average number of dedicated ultrasound faculty from these programs was three to four. And what we found from our survey respondents is that universally they all felt that ultrasound guided regional anesthesia was an important skill. Um, almost universally for residents and definitely for ultrasound fellows to learn. Um, what we also found is that programs that had more ultrasound faculty were more likely to be incorporating this into their curriculum. So whether simulation or didactic based learning, the more people, the more likely they were to teach it. And so then we, you know, wanted to know why weren't they teaching it and we sort of um, investigated what their barriers were to kind of routinely incorporating this and we found that faculty experience was the number one barrier, um, not feeling comfortable, you know, teaching it because they didn't feel comfortable doing it and um, some perceived um, political or interdepartmental barriers as well. 
And for the people who were teaching it, we found that about three quarters of them were not collaborating with another department. They were teaching it sort of on the job in the ED. Um, but of the departments that were collaborating, anesthesia was the most frequent um, collaboration. Which sort of leads us to our next point. So Dr. Fong, do you mind kind of speaking about how we harnessed our own strengths and met this educational need at our institution? Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me? Okay. For our program, the question of why collaboration was actually a very easy one. And it comes from a lot from what we experience in Casey's data, which is that ultrasound guided regional anesthesia is a great example of a practice innovation that's outpaced the training of our uh, staff physicians, attending physicians. Um, Casey noted that lack of adequate training or comfort level with ultrasound guided regional anesthesia was very common. I think more than 90% of us reported some discomfort. And in fact, 43% of these responding ultrasound directors had no formal training in regional anesthesia themselves, and more than 50% were dissatisfied with their current knowledge. And if you think about it, this is the core group of ultrasound experts, and for us to be reporting this, you can imagine the amount of discomfort that exists in a general ED faculty pool. So collaboration helped us with that, but not only, uh, but also the problem of caseload. So although hip fracture is a great indication for ultrasound, it's not a chest pain, it's not a laceration, it's not something that comes into the ED every day. By sending our residents to anesthesia to perform nerve blocks, we could guarantee on Thursday, if you go at 9 a.m., you are going to see an elbow, you're going to see uh, a hip. So it was very easy for us to create these uh, tailored experiences for residents. The first step in creating a collaboration is to really know thyself, to perform a good self-assessment of your own program, including strengths, including limitations of your program, opportunities for growth, and external threats. When you're doing this, you're doing this in your department, but you're also taking stock of any resources and needs outside of your own department. So, your, you'll brainstorm who are the users of point-of-care ultrasound in your institution. And there are some very common usual suspects, anesthesia, critical care, um, internal medicine sometimes. And open the lines of communication. You can even think more broadly or creatively. So if patient caseload or a trainee burden for those, a trainee competition for cases is an issue, think about your affiliate hospital where there aren't residents competing for procedures. Uh, think about if your institution has a school of medical imaging like ours does. A lot of my collaborations have actually come up from uh, courses in the Office of Faculty Development and just meeting people with common challenges. So the, the goal is to know yourself and know what exists in your world. That way you can match your needs and what you have to offer with another's. So when we assessed our strengths and our needs, we, we have a robust ultrasound program like most residencies do that has ample protected time for teaching. We have equipment and we have an ED with a constantly refreshing, uh, uh, refreshing caseload of undifferentiated complaints. Um, our need was Regional anesthesia, we, had, we have a group of faculty who's great, but not necessarily well-versed in these techniques. So if a hip fracture were to come into the ED, we would not even necessarily be able to take advantage of it. Fortunately, we have Dr. Lin from anesthesia who can speak to his needs and resources. But from our standpoint, we saw them as an expert group in nerve blocks and with a scheduled caseload that we could tap into. From there, we started to think about and brainstorm some natural areas for interaction and partnership. And what came very naturally was obviously first the educational collaboration. And how this looked for us was having regional anesthesia join us for diagnostic POCUS um, education. They in, uh, attended our intern boot camp. They come and join our two-week rotations. And in turn, we're able to send our regional, our ultrasound fellows to the OR to do nerve blocks and have even opened the opportunity to some senior residents. 
Dovetailing from this, we were able to include other specialties like orthopedics to help create pain management protocols for specific regional anesthesia indications in the ED with the thought of possibly creating a consult service whereby there's a fellow on call from regional and a hip fracture comes in, there's no one in the ED who feels comfortable doing it and we can engage and call them. Lastly, kind of boringly, there's the administrative side of ultrasound that we all deal with. Um, equipment, IT, QPath, cost sharing that we were able to engage and support each other in. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Lin, can you just expand a little bit about the current state of ultrasound training within anesthesia residency program? Sure. So obviously ultrasound is widely used in anesthesia practice, but specific guidelines for ultrasound training in anesthesiology residency is somewhat lacking. The ACGME program requirements for anesthesiology residency don't include the word ultrasound anywhere in it. And yet residents are expected to pick up ultrasound skills, diagnostics, and procedurally. Um, the ACGME does require that residents perform 40 peripheral nerve blocks and get one month of anesthesia experience in regional anesthesia. But this in and of itself doesn't constitute an ultrasound training curriculum. Now, guidelines do exist. The American and European Societies of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine published excellent guidelines in 2010, which are adopted by many training programs, but these at present aren't required. On the flip side of the coin, the ACGME does require mandatory ultrasound training for regional anesthesia fellowships, just these aren't necessarily well defined. Now, ultrasound training in anesthesiology can be divided into two main domains. A, diagnost a diagnostic domain or a procedural domain. And um, of note, residents don't typically begin ultrasound training in their anesthesiology residency programs until about the midpoint of their residencies when they break off into, into their subspecialty training blocks. So in the diagnostic category, there's perioperative TEE and focus TTE, which are the two most common applications of ultrasound in the diagnostic category for anesthesiology residents, typically picked up during the cardiac anesthesia rotation as well as ICU. Other less well implemented and emerging ultrasound applications include lung ultrasound, airway ultrasound, gastric, fast exams, and bladder scans. Now on the procedural side, ultrasound is most commonly used for peripheral nerve blocks and vascular access. And residents do get a bit of earlier exposure here. Um, though they do their dedicated regional rotations typically a little bit later in their residency programs. So here is a snapshot of the total peripheral nerve block experience in 2015 anesthesiology residency graduates. What I'd like to highlight here in the red box is that the most commonly performed nerve block by anesthesia residents in 2015 was a femoral nerve block, which clearly has a lot of relevance uh, as previously discussed by Dr. Wilson. But also, if you look at the most common block sites, they range a median number of procedures from 0 to 22, which really suggests that maybe 10 to 20 procedures of these basic ultrasound guided blocks is all that's needed for safe practice out in the community. Of course, coupled by expert instruction, goal-directed feedback, what have you. And there's some evidence that shows that this expert instruction and feedback does lower the learning curve to an average of about 10 procedures. So this puts um, these blocks well within the range of an educational collaborative effort between anesthesiology and emergency medicine. Now, my personal experience as a former fellow, having rotated in the ED, doing a point of care ultrasound rotation, was that ultrasound training was a very developed curriculum for emergency medicine residents. Um, my first experience was a boot camp session, which was a total day, a full eight hour day, starting off with didactics, basic ultrasound maneuvers, <laughs> ultrasound physics, workshops in which we were able to scan each other in the presence of a faculty member to give us immediate feedback. This was followed by structured and unstructured time with a faculty member kind of guiding us with scans and patients in the ED as well as picking up scans in our own time and we would save images and clips and review them during weekly conferences which we found very helpful for goal-directed feedback um, and you know, discussing larger topics putting it in the context of larger health problems. And uh, I couldn't help but notice that uh, ultrasound training was introduced very early in EM residency programs because all my peers were interns. 
So on the flip side of the coin, um, when I was supervising EM residents uh, in the regional anesthesia rotation, I found that actually novice emergency medicine residents were much more facile at ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia than anesthesia residents were. And this was really surprising to me at first, but then, of course, putting it in the context of how early EM residents get ultrasound training compared to about the midpoint for anesthesia residents, it kind of makes sense. These ultrasound skills are translatable. Um, and the EM residents typically set themselves up better for success. They had better um, ergonomics with the ultrasound probe, and they picked up needling and target image acquisition a bit faster. Um, they did require, of course, more teaching of perioperative medicine as a whole, physiology, pharmacology of regional anesthesia, and local anesthetics. But as far as ultrasound training goes, uh, they were they turned out a little bit better. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Regan here to talk about future ventures in uh, our collaborative effort. So um, I think when I was asked to come up and, and, and meet this group and, and talk here, uh, it really, to me, was a wonderful example of how true collaboration was really a success. Um, there was trust amongst groups. There was true teamwork and really being honest about where someone's strength is and what someone else needs. And being able to find that across departments, I think, really was uh, the, the responsible um, reason for why people really were successful in this venture. So finding out what your common goal is, uh, figuring out what you each need, and really figuring out how to maximize that so that people at the end, our patients, our trainees across both specialties, and the institution as a whole can really walk away better than they were before we started collaborating. So I think the last thing I want to say is that we've had such fun working with anesthesia. We have a new venture, uh, and we've actually developed a new combined emergency medicine anesthesiology residency program, um, which we're taking two interns in to start in July. Uh, and people are like, why in God's name would you do that? Uh, so I'll say that, you know, for me personally, as the director of the program, collaborating amongst um, emergency medicine and anesthesia, my reason for doing this is because I really feel like we need people working in emergency medicine who have emergency medicine as their core and interest, who are really going to be focusing on pain management and alternative modalities than what we're currently using for pain, um, in particular with the landscape of the opioid crisis in our country at this time. Um, I think obviously there's going to be a lot of opportunity for expanded uh, domains within airway and advanced airway skills as well within resuscitation and critical care. Um, but I think that the, the concept that's happened here about really maximizing how you can take care of patients pain in the acute setting and as well in the chronic setting for many of the patients we see coming back through our department really is an area where we're going to hopefully see a great, um, a great focus. And the goal here is to, pro is to produce those people that we don't have. Right, so right now we have faculty in ultrasound who don't have the skill set that they need in regional anesthesia. So we're hoping to be able to produce a small cadre of people who will be able to go out and do that and lead this, um, this charge for the future. I think we'll wrap up. These are our references, and we have no idea what time it is, so someone will have to let us know if we have time to take questions. <laughs> we're good. Any questions? Yeah, um, I was in a similar situation as a junior resident interested in ultrasound, and that's sort of how this all came to be. Um, and so I basically reached out to the regional team and said, hey, would you take me on as, as an elective? And that's sort of how this all came about. So I think if your institution or one of your partnering institutions has opportunities, um, reach out and see if anybody else would be willing to host you. Um, maybe an, even an elective outside of your institution could be an option. Um, there are courses that you can attend, and then Lots of really great websites, um, apps, other, you know, opportunities for sort of engagement and self-directed learning, too. Well, so I guess my other part of the question is if, if I do feel like it, it, like more so the resistance is I feel comfortable doing it, mm -hmm. but the attending doesn't feel comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a commentary on that? That's the problem. That's the challenge. Sarah? Yes. So I'm one of the old faculty. <laughs>
<laughs> no, no dissing you. meant. No dissing meant. I think that part of the issue, though, is people who learn on, you know, self-directed learning on modules, on, um, you know, a simulator. The first time your live patient is in front of you, people are nervous. And I think having the ability to go to a place where there are live people with normal tissue and anatomy and being able to do that with someone who does it on a regular basis really enables the faculty to say, you know what, yes, I might have only done three, but I've done five on a simulator and three in real life, and someone who does this for a living thinks I'm okay to do it. And I think it's developing that confidence in addition to the skill set in some of the older faculty, myself included, who didn't train on this that really helps it to become more of a cultural practice as opposed to a thing we're doing out of, but with fear. Um, and that makes residents nervous, right? When your faculty is like, all right, I guess, let's go. No, you want someone who's going to feel confident to do that. So I think there's a lot of ways you can put together a program where you have great education and hopefully some opportunities where people can do it for real so that the first time they do it for real is not while they're teaching it to someone else. And maybe one thing I'd like to add is, you know, coming from the perspective of a ultrasound, you know, uh, in anesthesia and growing a block service is that when we first begin interfacing with surgeons and um, who are unfamiliar with blocks and we try to grow a service with them and offer blocks to surgeons who don't really aren't necessarily welcome um, one thing that we'd find helpful is the willingness to follow up with the patients to see what the duration of the block is to see what the neurologic complications are obviously in the ED this is somewhat limited but just ha just that willingness and um, you know, taking it on on yourself to call the patient to follow up, to kind of uh, you know just bring that to you know, whomever it is that's supervising you in your um, venture to get extra blocks can be very helpful. And if the surgeons see that that you're willing to do this and essentially behave in that way, then they're willing to let you do more blocks. So that's just a couple cents there. That was a challenge. Um, someone describes uh, one member of our privileging committee as uh, having a personality disorder. And he, he had these very interesting expectations about how many of each particular category of things. He wanted to separate out the number of blocks by location. He wanted us to have like 50 gallbladder ultrasounds, crazy things that are not in line with our guidelines. but. I think it was just us pulling literature and showing it to him and showing national guidelines that was able to shape him. But yeah, I think our number for blocks is similar to ASAP's procedural number, which is 10. And that's just locally. John. Um, so we used to have like 10 blocks supervised by one of you, the ultrasound faculty, yeah. or of anesthesia. What is the actual? So right now, it's, we include it in procedure day. So we have two big ultrasound labs per year. And procedures comes up every year, every, every other year, I believe. And that's generally one of the six procedures that we opt to highlight. For residents, we don't, we don't impose this on people. We introduce it. And for those who have a special interest, they often reach out and ask to do the regional elective. And together with uh, Jason Brookman, who's also a regional anesthesi re anesthesiologist, we created a set of readings, a set of uh, block goals for the rotation, um, focusing on the ED indications for nerve blocks. 
Yeah, and, and in the anesthesia elective, per se, that's a two-week elective that we offer for the residents. Um, we essentially assign a set of core lectures. It's 90 hours, according to you know, our toolbox that we assign them. Uh, we have a lecture curriculum, um, and we you know, have a blue phantom that we essentially put them through an hour or so between blocks. We, we know, they hit the ground running, so you know, obviously the first case blocks go. And we have them watch, or if there's time, we have them maybe needle if we've seen them ultrasound before. But then they go through you know, basic maneuvers for an hour on the blue phantom. And at that point, with lectures, with instruction and supervision from our department, from the regional anesthesia faculty, that's how you know, we teach them. And we essentially have them you know, do at least 10 during their time. Yeah, yeah. There, we, yeah, we consider that also a peripheral nerve block, and uh, you know, our one of our primary volume of blocks in our trauma ortho area is interscalene blocks. So we just do a, a tremendous number of those. So they do get to see quite a bit of that. I think we're running out of time, but thank you all so much.